Hey, good morning. How are y'all this morning? Hey, I get to uh, do the cleanup on the Relational First Aid series, and I get to tell you everything you need to know about marriage in 30 minutes or less. At least that's what I heard last week, if you were here. Um, this is a series about what you can do in order to help people who are working in different relationships. And my task this morning is to give you some ideas about what you can do to work with people who are married, even if you're not married. And so this sermon is actually structured a little bit different. Um, I want to give you some very practical suggestions a little bit later on, on what you can do, especially if you are newly married or you are not married and you're working with people who are married which is really the practical side of the sermon. But I also want to tell you today what has gone wrong with marriages and a little bit of theology about what you can do to help with that. So as we begin, I have some pictures of my family that I want to show you because it's always fun to show off my family. Um, flip on to the next slide. This is us when we first moved here. Um, many of you know Austin. He's over there on the um, left-hand side, the little cutie boy right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's so nice. Alex, um, he's 280 pounds. He doesn't fit on my lap anymore. Um, he's a 17-year-old, and he is going to come here next semester, which will be really cool. And it's Audrey at the top and Audrey on the left. This is our family at Christmas. If you can flip to the next one. That's kind of what our family's like. So if you're not married, you're going to actually look like that sometime with your crazy kids, which is going to be kind of fun. Um, there's Austin down there, Mr. Daniel Boone, sort of. If you know Austin, he hates outside. He's kind of allergic to it, so um, that's just a great picture for him. Um, as you think about marriage, just as we get started today, think about all the changes that you have to go through between being unmarried to being married. And one of the changes that I think is the most hilarious and the one that was really, is, is probably the most difficult one for me, is uh, waking up in the middle of the, the night to somebody breathing on me who has bad breath. You know, in all of my wildest dreams, I never dreamt that I would wake up in the middle of the night with somebody drink, uh, breathing dragon breath on me, which is just like ruins everything. In fact, I actually roll over and I just kind of like act like I'm not mad. Um, you know, you just, you just don't think about all of those wonderful expectations of living life on top of each other. Uh, today, I really want to start with a personal story about the problem that we will all encounter with marriage. And this, this story happened about six years ago. Uh, my wife and I had gone through a really difficult time. Our kids had been sick, and for many of you that have uh, been affiliated with the college for a long time, you know that my kids were sick. Um, Audrey and Austin were both very ill a number of years ago. And what happens is, is that a marriage ends up taking a toll. And Vanna and I became crossways as a result of the stresses and strains that were associated with having hospitalizations and kids and all of that. And something happened to us. I can't really tell you what it was. I can just tell you that my greatest relationship became adversarial. I, I didn't really like that. And so I was working and trying to get things moving forward in a really positive way. And I ended up losing my patience. And when I lose my patience, I strategize on what to do to make the other person's life as miserable as the way that I'm feeling. And so I decided that I would begin to treat my wife in the way that I perceived that she was treating me. You fight fire with fire, right? That's what you do. I mean, everybody knows that if you're a firefighter, you fight fire with fire. And so I set out to uh, fight fire with fire, and things just deteriorated for some unknown reason. I mean, being nice didn't work, and fighting fire with fire didn't seem to be going so well. And I had to go on a trip, and uh, I was heading out to uh, NYR at the end of, January, or at the end of uh, July, and I was um, outside of Hutchinson spending the first night in a hotel room, and I just couldn't sleep. Um, you know those nights when God has business to do with you. And so I got up, I went out and sat on the curb, and very rarely does this happen to me, but these words popped into my head, because I'm like praying and I'm angry, and these words came into my head, and they were, oh, why won't you forgive your wife? Why won't you forgive Vanna? Well, I'm not going to give you all the reasons, but I gave God all the reasons why I didn't want to do that. And so for a number of minutes, I just listed off all of the things that I was really, really frustrated about. 
And then these words popped into my head, because I was feeling pretty good about myself, thinking, you know, I have a reason. I have a reason. Do you ever feel that way? I have a reason to act this way. I have a reason to feel this way. And then the next words were, don't you want to be like me? Don't you want to be like me? Well, my answer immediately was, no, of course not. <laughs> I want to be like me. Don't you want to help me? I want to be like me. How do we get to that position? Because, brothers and sisters, that's where we get in our marriages with conflict. We get so self-focused, we get so involved with who we want to be and what's important to us that we forget about the magnificence and the beauty that marriage is supposed to show to the world. And it happened to me. It happens to all of us at some point. So I want to talk to you about the problem, the culture of me. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. There's even a website on the culture of me. That's where this came from um, on that slide. But this culture of me is something that social scientists and theologians are writing a great deal of material about. And I've excerpted some comments that I just want to give you to get you thinking about you. The culture of you in a relationship with somebody that you have pledged to give your very best to at all times. Most of these quotes, not all of them, most of these quotes come from Timothy Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage, where he does a very good job of outlining this particular problem. Um, social science indicates that marriage is really good for you. It, it's really outstanding for you. In fact, people who divorce will often remarry. What you might not know is the average American male marries at age 28, and the average American female marries at age 26 for their first marriage because there are three cohabitations that are going on before marriage. We are from a betrayal culture, and as a result of that betrayal culture, we're not sure that we can get married and stay married, and that age is getting pushed up farther and farther to 30, um, much later than what it ever has been. Marriage has become self-focused. Tara Parker Pope wrote in the New York Times, the notion that the best marriages are those that bring satisfaction to the individual may seem counterintuitive. After all, isn't marriage supposed to be about putting the relationship first? Not anymore. For centuries, marriage was viewed as an economic and social institution, and the emotional and intellectual needs of the spouses were secondary to the survival of the marriage itself. But in modern relationships, people are looking for a partnership, and they want partners who make their lives more interesting, who help each other attain valued goals. Marriage used to be about us, but now it is about me. Do, do you know that there's no such thing as a completely compatible person to marry? I'm not saying go out and marry somebody you don't like. But what I am saying is this. The person that you marry, that you think is all that wonderful, is actually going to be that person that breathes bad breath on you sometime in the middle of the night. Is that person that you're going to have to pick up after. Is that person that you're not going to fully understand. And so if you're looking, ladies, Twilight, if you're looking for the most wonderful experience ever, we're not vampires. We don't look that good. And we breathe bad breath. It's just not going to happen on the level that society says that it must happen for us. Here's another quote. Both men and women today want a marriage in which they can receive emotional and sexual satisfaction from someone who will simply let them be themselves. They want a spouse who is fun, intellectually stimulating, sexually attractive, with many common interests, and who, on top of it all, is supportive of their personal goals and the way they are living now. Marriage is about me. It's about what I want. It's about me succeeding. Do you know that marriages are failing at a faster rate in our country than they have ever failed before? They are failing much earlier and much harder than what they have failed. National Marriage Project reports a pornographic media culture may also contribute to unrealistic expectations of what their future soulmates should look like, influenced by the sexy images of young women on MTV, the internet, and on the runway in televised Victoria's Secret specials. Men may be putting off marriage to their current girlfriend in the hopes that they will eventually find a combination soulmate babe. Gentlemen, we don't look at twilight. We look at something else. And what happens to us is that we begin to have unrealistic expectations just like the ladies do. And when we look at and saturate our view of women with what is portrayed as the ideal, and I like this here, soulmate babe, we are not going to be satisfied with our wife. Because she is that, but she's also a mother, and she also breathes bad breath on you, 
and she also wants things to be done a particular way, she is not going to be that runway girl. We need to have a real relationship with a real woman. For men and women, romantic love and its idealism has replaced committed love and its practical application. As a culture, when we threw God out of our relationships, we put sex and unrealistic idealism of personal satisfaction in his place. Here's what has happened to us in a nutshell. Because we as a culture have thrown God out, the scripture is very clear that what comes in is the satisfaction of ourselves personally. In Ephesians chapter 4, 17, 18, and 19, Paul opens that up and says that we will please ourselves physically. What we eat, what we see, where we go, what we do. And you can see that a marriage cannot be built on that. The problem is pretty grave. However, I do want you to know that longitudinal studies say that two-thirds of all unhappy marriages today will become happy within five years if people will stay together and not divorce. That's pretty amazing. There is hope that is out there. Even in the secular research, we know that if we hang tough and we work on our issues, then things can actually get better. So let's go back to the Don't You Want to Be Like Me story outside Hutchinson, Kansas. Don't you want to be like me? Not particularly. So I went back and I laid down and I tossed and turned all night. The next day was the 23rd wedding anniversary of Peter and Vanna Buckland. Imagine that. We, we weren't getting along all that well. And so here I am going across Kansas up and down the hills. I called my wife and I said, I'm on the top of a hill, but if I go down, I might miss you. And so I haven't hung up on you, but I, I will call you back. Because you know that when your wife thinks you're mad at her, then the whole world is terrible. And so I called her and I said, I want you to know that I need to apologize to you. I have chosen a method to try to do something good that is the wrong method. And I want to apologize to you. I have not done the right thing. And my wedding anniversary gift to you is an apology. There was silence on the other end of the phone. And then there was this. Yes. When we do things God's way, God's blessings follow. And it's just real simple. But we get all turned around within our culture. We do things God's way, God's blessings follow. And so to be the right kind of a person is the right decision to make even when it's hard. My wife did not apologize to me for eight months. Just because you do the thing that God tells you to do doesn't mean that the other person is magically going to make everything better. But my relationship is better today, hanging through that situation and getting to the other side. And I want to show you some things about that. Some theological points I don't want you to forget about. First of all, our relationship uh, with our wives is highly relational, and it is based on the Trinity with our husbands and wives, and the Trinity forms the foundation for our understanding of our marriages. You see, God is made of three distinct people in one relationship. We don't know how that works. I don't even know the very best way to say that. But a marriage is made of three people, a man and a woman and God, and they are all distinct from each other. And they are to function based off of the model of the way that God treats himself. That's pretty profound. Not out of what I can get out of the relationship, not whether or not my wife gets what she wants, but it is based off of this high degree of relationality in the marriage that's based upon God. God is this first family, the first marriage, the first place to go. The Trinity lives in perfect relationship. And in Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33, there is this little statement in the epistle that Paul writes about, that our marriages are to be a reflection of Jesus and the church. And not only is there a husband and a wife and God in the relationship, but there is the love story of Jesus and the church. You see, when I'm not treating my wife the right way, go back to 2006, when I'm struggling with that, I'm stepping outside of the identity that I should have in Christ, and as a result of that, God can't bless it. You can't fight fire with fire. You can only fight fire with forgiveness. 
You can only fight fire with patience. You can only fight fire with mercy. You can only fight fire with goodness. You can only fight fire with kindness. You can't fight fire with fire. Not in a marriage. You have to fight it with the personality of God in you, overwhelming whatever the problem is. So when you look at a marriage and you see two people fighting, neither one of them is acting like God. And it's just not going to work. Marriage is God's idea to reflect Him within the world. The supreme value in marriage is not personal pleasure. It's not the meeting of personal needs. It's not feeling connected to our spouse all the time. The supreme value in marriage is to continually reflect the love of God for each other and the world around us no matter what. That's what marriage is all about. It's totally different than the marriage of the world. So when you talk to a Christian couple that is struggling, you have to set the high view of who they are supposed to be. That is step number one. Without that high view, they're not going to get anywhere. Marriage is a continual relationship. It's a 24-7 relationship. And our human tendency since the fall is to refocus everything according to ourselves. And so every single day I get an opportunity as a married person to learn how to love better. Even when I don't love so good to start with. Marriage is a tested relationship. David Foster Wallace wrote this. He said, being an adult requires self-sacrifice, not merely in order so that we may receive future gain, but also so that we might not lose ourselves in the culturally sanctioned decree that we have a right to get what we want, how and when we want it. Isn't that interesting? Do you all remember the last characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. The Holy Spirit gives us the self-control that we need to be countercultural, to be able to stand up and say, I need to do this the right way and a different way, or we will fall into the tide of just doing our own thing. He goes on to say, it is a culture of self that determines personal happiness to be the highest virtue. He adds, the world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. But freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, little, unsexy ways every day. You cannot will yourself into a better marriage. You can only yield yourself into a better marriage. You can only yield yourself into a better marriage. While it is true that you have specific decisions to make, Christian marriage is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Always having to be relationally close and intimate, having your selfishness tested all the time is too difficult to face on your own. For some marriages to improve, they must begin with personal repentance. Apologizing to my wife was only step one. So, here are some common issues. Uh, this next slide that's up here has a slide of colored people sitting around a table. What are you going to do? What are all of the options that you have that you might want to use in your relationship? So, here are some practical things. Um, I always wonder what people are laughing about. I... Uh, I also put up here, this next slide is a slide about um, the power struggle that can actually happen between a husband and a wife. You might not know this, but marriage is often about managing emotional distance and managing power. Emotional distance and power. I mean, how close is close? Ladies, how often do you want to be around your beloved anyway? If you're not married, you want to be around him 85, 23, if there was such a time frame rather than 24, 7. You'd want him all the time. I often tell people that you want him 125% of the time. You, you want to manage that, but you really want to be with him in that way. How, how close do you really want to be? And there's this emotional management and this management of power that goes on. And so I asked one of the ladies on the campus who's newly married to get with her gaggle of girls and come up with some questions that I might be able to answer. So here are some questions, and I just want to do this fairly briefly. This is the... Um, go through this section, and I just want you to listen to some of these. Who should be the leader when it comes to finances? Think about the Trinity. 
I, and it said, should both husband and wife be a part of taking care of finances? Yes. Yes, they should function as a team. Two, is there a certain amount of time a couple should wait to have kids? Think about cooperating, getting along. Think about working together as a team. But if there's no accidental pregnancy, you know how that goes when you're first married, then they prayerfully believe, they, they should prayerfully decide when they should begin. Number three, how should a husband and a wife handle problems when their families are not getting along? I first thought about shoot everybody, but that probably wouldn't be the right thing to say. <sighs> you know how rough that can be. I think you just have to pray your way through that, and you need some outside help. Number four, what defines a nagging wife? Well, Webster's Dictionary does. <laughs> so here's the definition of nagging. To annoy by constant scolding, complaining, or urging to constantly find fault. Number two, to be a constant source of anxiety or annoyance. That's a nagging wife. So I put, sometimes a nagging wife is caused by a passive resistant husband. So men don't be the cause of a nagging wife. We can talk about that privately in the recesses of the chapel if you've got one of those. A wife nags when she believes her husband will not get something done, tries to direct him on a regular basis. Nagging can be a way to try to lessen anxiety. So listen to your wife, even when her issues seem small or insignificant to you. Go back to the Trinity. Do you think that the, that the father looks at Jesus and goes, I don't really care what you think, you're just the son. I don't really care what you think, you've been a human and I haven't, what do you know about anything? You know, you look at that and think, when we take the Trinity as our organizing understanding, it changes everything in the way that we re relate to each other. She wants you to know that you're interested in her even when you don't get her. Can I get an amen, ladies? She wants you to know that she's interested in her, the real her, the scared her, the hurt her, the unsure her, even when you don't get her. Amen. We sometimes don't do so well with that. Um, fifth question, how can a wife voice that she wants her husband to be more of a leader in all aspects of their marriage? Ladies, I do want you to know that you cannot be direct with this. If you look at him and say, you're not being the leader you need to be, I promise you, he will prove that that is a correct statement. He, he will not be the leader. Because when you attack a man directly like that, on an area that he wants to be competent in, some little switch goes off in his head, and it says, fight her to the death. <laughs> Why do you think I had trouble in 2006? There's a switch. So let me tell you what you do to manipulate a man to be a better leader. This works for everything. <laughs> Gentlemen, don't listen too much, or at least enjoy it when it happens to you. Find out what he does and tell him you want more of that. Find out what he does, that he does really, really well, and tell him that you want him to do more of that. And the way that you test this is you wait until he's doing something that he really, 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 really wants to do. And you walk up to him and say, oh, man, you're so busy. I just wanted to tell you something I appreciated about you, but I can see you're way too busy for that. And turn around and walk away. <laughs> Try it. He will get up and he will follow you. <laughs> He'll say, no, no, really, really, I'm okay. I'm okay. Tell me what you really, tell, tell me what you're thinking. How many times, let, let me just ask men this. How many times does somebody tell you something they appreciate about you? How many times? Not very many. You see, the key, ladies, to your husband's heart or to your man's heart is through appreciation for what he really does. And then you tell him, I want you to do more of those things. If you nag him and badger him, you will not get anywhere with him because there's that switch inside of him that works against you. In the midst of an argument, is it a good idea for a couple to separate for a while and then come back together? <laughs> Maybe, sometimes, yes. I put only if separating is productive to gather your thoughts and you actually come back and talk. Number seven, if a couple's really struggling at the beginning of their marriage, what would your advice be? If you're Peter Buckland right now, and you've heard a little bit about this, what would you say my advice would be? If you're struggling in your marriage right now, and you're in conflict with your marriage, what should be the first thing that you do? Mine started with the letter R. If we played hangman, we'd put it up here. Repent. Repent. Find out what you're doing that needs to be done differently. You look in the mirror and see, do I need to do something a little different? I said, repent and apologize for any stubbornness. Pray together every day about what kind of marriage you want to have. Find a mentoring couple to talk to once a week or so. And if needed, go to a counselor to speed up the growing together process. Repent, change, recognize you can get stuck. Raise your hand and say, this can actually happen to me. And then I put in your, uh, this last question, in your opinion, what's the most important thing to a marriage? I'm glad it's my opinion. I put this. 
yielding to the work of God in your own life. Yielding to the work of God in your own life. Brothers and sisters, if we want to help people in their own marriages, we have to become a person who reflects the great love of God. We have to be the person that listens and cares and moves forward with people who are really hurting. We have to be the kind of a person that can um, help people find their next step because we're living the same kind of life. You see, the really cool thing about Ozark, and one of the reasons that I'm here, is I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe that you can come here and you can come out of a horrible culture and you can become somebody who reflects God. Somebody entirely different. I believe in that. And I believe that it's possible. It's why we get up every morning and we do what we do over and over and over again. Is because we believe in the God that stands behind you. No matter what you face, life can be different. And the reason that you go out and you preach and you teach and you minister and you um, do the work that you do is because you know that God stands behind his word. He does not stand behind fire fights fire, but he stands behind his word. And if we can turn the tide in somebody's life by having them get connected with God, that's going to be pretty amazing. Here are some things just to think about at the very end. Timothy Keller states that the focus of our marriage is to be spirit-generated selflessness, not thinking less of ourselves, not thinking more of ourselves, but overall spending less time thinking about ourselves. Spending less time thinking about ourselves. So some strategies for you to think about. When you work with married couples, the number one marital problem is communication, and you need to listen to people. So I want to suggest that you be quiet and you don't add fuel to the fire. What a married couple needs is somebody who's for them, not somebody who takes sides. You take the side of God. You take the side of righteousness. You take the side of healing. That's the side that you take. And ladies, one of the things that I often think about is when women go and they talk to their girlfriends and they come back and fight with their husbands, that should not be. They should come back knowing how to love their husbands better and put up with him. And guys, when you go out and you do your thing with your guys, you ought to come back and you ought to be able to love your wife better and not pick on her anymore. You never go and find somebody who tells you what you want to hear. You go and find somebody who tells you the truth. Somebody will tell you the truth. So you can go home and love the way that you need to love. Often personal, experience, or personal expectations are at the root of marital difficulty. Every partner has his or her own idea what the, what the marriage should be like. So remember that the culture of me lives in you. And the culture of Christ is what we need to develop. And so putting them in touch with Jesus. If I could write a prescription for every married couple that was having trouble, and sometimes I get out my little hand and I pretend like I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm writing a prescription. The prescription is go to church. Go to church. Don't stop going to church. Go to church. Go to every Bible study you can. Go interact with everybody that you know how. Go listen to that sermon and take it home and talk about it. Go to church. Meet God on God's territory. The number one relationship skill you have to have in a marriage is forgiveness. You have to have forgiveness. And so you and I have to be the first forgivers in the church. We have to know how forgiveness works. And I promise you that God will bring you to a point where you will learn what forgiveness is. We are spiritual beings, and as married partners, we must each have our own personal devotional life, as well as marital devotional experiences together. Now, if I could just talk to the ladies here. A woman who does not have her own devotional life will count on her husband to do all the devotioning for her, and you will wreck your marriage. You know why? Because your husband isn't God. You might think that he's really close when you first marry, and then he wakes up in the morning and breathes on you, and you know that he's not God. It's probably from the other place with that breath. But if you get lazy, only God can hold you together. Your husband can't hold you together. He cannot hold you together. Can I say that again? He can't hold you together. You have to allow for Christ to hold you together so your life is a gift back to your husband. And gentlemen, it's hard living with a woman. You just don't know what's going to come out. You don't know if she's having a good day or a bad day or where she's at emotionally. God has given her color, and he has given you the wonderful privilege of seeing that color up front and personal. And we look at that, and we don't know what to do with it. 
And so God gives you the glasses that you can see your woman through her emotions to see who she really is. And you don't put those glasses on every day, you're not going to be able to see your wife. You're not going to be able to understand what she's going through. And you will create distance. You've got to have God put those glasses on you. And so every day you've got to have your devotional life. And you know, a marriage of three, a husband, a wife, and God, works. Do you know there's a saying that Christian counselors have? The marriage that prays together stays together. And so you have to work together in order to make this relationship work. Put up the last slide, if you would. What do I want you to get out of this today? I want you to get just a few things. First thing I want you to get out of this is what I'm talking to you about is completely foreign to the American culture. In fact, it's probably mostly foreign to every culture. When God came down and he wanted to set things right through Jesus, everything was backwards. Everything was wrong. And marriages weren't doing the right kind of thing. And you and I are encultured in a culture that says, do what you want, when you want, how you want. We're not encultured with a culture of Christ. We're not encultured with a culture of community. We're encultured with a culture of me. And so one of the things that I really want for you to do is repent today. I want you to repent of the self-idolatry of yourself. And I want you to go today sometime and ask for God to show you what you need to change in your life to be a Christ follower who's countercultural. Christ follower who will do what Christ asks you to do, which is to act like you are related to the God of the universe who will teach you how to act and think. And so we have to repent. We have to change. Or you will find yourself out on some lonely Kansas way calling your spouse, and you'll be doing it that way. The second thing that I want for you to think about is this. That marriage is based upon God as the author of life. And so the one thing, if you don't know what else to do with a couple, is that you, you take them and you take them to Christ. And you say, God, you have created this marriage. You are the author of marriage, and you make this marriage work. You figure out a way to help this couple take the next step. I don't have to know all your problems. I don't have to know what's going on. I don't need all the details. But I need to take you to the one who knows. And so I will move you on and allow for you to have an interaction with Christ. My final question for you today is this. If God were talking to you and he had an opportunity to sit down with you, no matter what your experience has been, and he says to you, don't you want to be like me? What would you say? How would you answer him? Lord God, give us wisdom. Teach us what you want us to know. Move us forward. Help us to be like you. And Lord, I want to ask, as a pastoral leader of this campus, that you will touch the lives of our students and you will challenge them today or within this week to answer the question, don't you want to be like me, with the answer, yes, I do. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.